Welcome back to the Birdies and Bourbon Show. Uh, joined once again, uh, we got a, a familiar face and a new face uh, with our friends from Filmland Spirits. We've got Steve Canepa, Steve and Charlie Flint. Guys, thanks for joining us today. We much appreciate it. Um, thanks, we're gonna, thanks for having us. It's yeah, great sure to be thing. here with you guys again. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and Thanks for sharing uh, some of the bourbon with us. I know the last time we were on, we uh, we tasted through Rise of the Robots. Fantastic rye. If you haven't had it, absolutely should. We'll probably talk a little about the affiliate program that you guys just started a little later in the show. Um, but but before we do, let's talk about what we're going to be drinking today. Uh, we're going to get to know and familiarize ourselves a little with the Filmland Spirits team. And uh, I think Steve and I are going to chat a little golf at the end of this thing. So uh, I, he may be on the putting green. If you, so if you're just <laughs> listening, uh, you won't see the putting green uh, behind Steve, but he couldn't, uh, couldn't miss an opportunity to boast about that a little. But it looks fantastic. <laughs> I, I'd be doing the same thing. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know if uh, Charlie or Steve, you want to uh, kind of take us through what we're going to be tasting today? Sure. So what you have in front of you there is Moonlight Mayhem. Uh, a saga of werewolves and bourbon, which is our kind of our standard um, 94 proof uh, bourbon. It's uh, it's a uh, 70 it's a 75 21, so 75 percent corn, 21 percent rye, and the 4 percent malted barley mash bill. Um, distilled in Indiana and produced on location is the term that we like to use, right? So the barrels are are aging. Um, those aged and and the additional barrels we have are aging. And then we blend a bottle in Kentucky. So this is, um, we specifically made this product to be approachable to uh, both seasoned drinkers as well as new drinkers. Um, tried to create something that wasn't, you know, super high proof, something that had, you know, a lot of flavor and character to it and, and could be kind of a, <laughs> a, a gateway uh, whiskey, if you will, for, you know, for, uh, for folks who may not have as, um, you know, experienced of a palate. And, um, and, you know, tried to make it, it, it as something that can be drunk, you know, great neat or on the rocks or uh, as I often use it in a cocktail as well. I don't, Steve, you have anything you would add to that? No, I think you, you summed it up. I mean, I, I know that um, as we put it together, the three of us who did it are a little bit more advanced on the journey. I think I mentioned that to you guys last time when we were talking about the rye, but sure. along the way, we definitely kept thinking and for people who were, uh, earlier on in the, in the, in the whiskey journey. So we, like Charlie said, just try to make it a nice, you know, right down the middle for both. We'll get to the the one that's a little more advanced here in a bit, but this is the one that's, we think um, for, for a broader audience. Yeah. So just a comment, and then uh, I'll ask you guys to maybe share a little about yourself and what you do at Filmland. Um, but the one thing that I appreciate, um, I, I, I'm a drinker. So, you know, and, and when you're addressing or when you're labeling something as an approachable bourbon, right, or approachable whiskey, uh, I love the fact that you went 94 as approachable instead of an 80 or an 85 or, you know, it, and, and again, I mean, this doesn't drink like it's, you know, 90 plus proof for sure. Uh, it's, it is, it is just that it is extremely approachable. Um, yeah, kind of that, uh, candied flavors, but yeah, I, I'll pause there. I just wanted to throw that out. I, I think great, um, uh, uh, great step for you guys in, in introducing this to the market and, and where you are. I think it's kind of grabbing probably, um, uh, we'll, again, we'll get to the, um, uh, the full, full proof or barrel proof in a, uh, later on, but yeah, I, I like the, I like the fact that you guys, uh, kind of bump that proof up there. So, um, as we're tasting and sipping, uh, I don't want you guys want to kind of start us off and give us uh, how'd you wind up here in the whiskey business? Charlie, why don't you go first? Because I've I've kind of done it before, but uh, I'll do I'll <laughs> sure. do I'll do a, a bridge version in a second. But you're new to the sure, right? and and I'll do it a bridge version as well. Because honestly, for you guys as well as for anybody that that heard um, part one of this, I guess with with our partner Troy. Um, his story is, is in many ways my story because Troy and I have known each other for 30 plus years. Um, lived, you know, I, I used to live, I currently live in Atlanta, but I used, so Cal, um, I thought you were going to invite me over for this, but here I am in, in, in my own place. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but I used to live in, in LA and Troy and I over the years have, have written together. So we've been writing partners in the past. We've, you know, worked on projects together and then, um, 
you know, my writing career wasn't especially distinguished. So eventually I left uh, California and moved to Atlanta um, and took on a new career. But Troy and I always stayed in touch. And, and he and I, um, over the years, kind of re- like a, maybe a decade ago, realized that we both were really into whiskey. Um, and, and we're both collecting a lot of whiskey, bourbons, you know, American whiskey in particular. Sure. And so he started coming out this way. He, you know, a couple of times here, he'd fly out here. He and I would load up the car um, and drive up to Kentucky and just spend a bunch of time going around visiting distilleries like crazy people. Um, and, you know, buying as many bottles as we could possibly fit in the car to haul back and, you know, and, and all those things. And it kind of got worse as we went along to the point that we were like, you know, we'd meet distillers, um, particularly in some of the smaller, you know, smaller distilleries. I would be like, dude, can we just like, you know, spend the day and work? And they'd be like, hell yeah. You want to haul corn? <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> and so, you know, there were some times that we were even, you know, like we were working, um, working in these places and it just, you know, like it was feeding into our understanding of the process and the people. And, you know, we just fell in love with it all along the way. Um, cause it's such a great, you know, it's a great product, right? If you, if you're whiskey drinkers, obviously you love the end product. Um, but the people that are, that are working in the industry are all like really solid, just honest, hardworking, you know, great people to be around and work with. And on one of the dry, you know, one of the trips, one of the days, Troy turned and was like, we, you know, we have to do this. And so that, you know, that kind of kicked it off. And then, you know, I won't go into the whole long story. Cause like I said, Troy shared it before. <laughs> But he and a, another business partner started working on the business plan piece of it. And then we started evolving kind of the, you know, the creative concepts behind it, put together a plan and actually started then, you know, going out and, and looking for business partners. And along came Steve. So, Steve, I'll let you pick it up from there. <laughs> yeah. So I came in much later, uh, just a couple of years ago through the other partner's uh, spouse was a coworker of mine in my previous life. She introduced me to Troy and, and, you know, at that time they were looking for both investors and also looking for advice on how to make this concept relatable to people that either may be investors or down the road customers. And they approached me more just as a, Hey, you've done a lot of these kind of presentations and stuff in your career. Uh, We hit it off. Uh, Originally it was uh, just a sounding board for the presentation, but eventually I'm like, I want to be involved in this. Um, They, we had a common love of whiskey. I, I'm a little more worldwide. I have a lot of Scotch. I have a lot of Irish. I have a lot of Japanese. Sure. Um, but but you know, I still have probably 80, 80 to 100 bottles of American stuff. So we found that bond. Um, I w- was never planning on being part of the the uh, blending team and all that. But once we figured out that um, my palate was okay, um, I, I got to join in that, and that's been a, a blast. And then meeting all the people, I got to go to Kentucky and visit distilleries for. Uh, the first time in my life with with Charlie and Troy, and and that was fantastic. Um, so my official role, though, is a CFO. So um, I do have to kind of watch some of the fi- the financial aspects of the of the business too. But I'll tell you what: when I make my list of things to do with the company, that's usually in the in the bottom <laughs> quartile versus <laughs> tasting, blending, talking to people, going to stores, um, sure. being involved in in the business side of it is much more fun. But at, at the end of the day, I have to think about the numbers a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's uh, there's three or four people in the blending team. So two of you and two others. Yeah. So, yeah. Troy, who you met before, sure. the CEO of our company, and then the uh, family ownership of the bottling facility that we both age and age our barrels in Kentucky and then eventually blend and bottle. Um, uh, one of the owners is part of the blending team also. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and we're drinking again, uh, Moonlight Mayhem 94 proof and uh, aged uh, a minimum of four years. Right. So I, I don't know if there is there anything older or what's what, what are you guys working yeah. with that you can mention? Yeah. yeah. Um, so so those barrels at the time we bottled were just shy of five years. Um, and and we bought a whole bunch of barrels kind of together at the same time. So those those same barrels now are coming are coming up on a there's a few different lots. Um, the oldest of them are coming up on a birthday. Um, so those original barrels that we bought are coming up on what will be six years, not too long from now. Um, and then we have some other stuff that that is sourced um, sourced from a different um, from a different source than MGP. 
that um, has a different age, but it's not a product we've released yet. So not to be like coy okay. or anything. But we, we we'll ask the trade secrets in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get yeah. there as we uh, yeah, we'll let's have a few more drinks first. It usually right, exactly. uh, yeah, ply us with more booze. Yeah, yeah you, you, usually usually goes better. Uh, yeah, I mean this is uh, this is wonderful. I, I haven't tried it before today. I did share some with Dan and yeah. uh, you know cherry citrus. Uh, definitely getting some of the oak characteristics. I mean, I would say a lot of the traditional bourbon notes that you would be that you would expect or look for. Uh, I don't know that I would need this anything much other than neat. I mean, I don't need anything. I don't need any rocks in it. Uh, stand up great in a cocktail. But uh, yeah, I mean, are you all neat drinkers or what's uh, what's kind of the poor choice? Predominantly neat for me um, and cocktails. So rarely do I just pour whiskey over ice, although I'm not opposed to it, especially on a hot summer night. Um, out on the putting green, I may just need something green. to pull me off. But um, <laughs> typically, it's typically neat or a, a, a old fashioned or Manhattan are my go tos. Yeah, and I'm I'm the same. I'm a neat drinker for the most part, like especially if you get into higher proof stuff. Um, I you know I do if I do make a cocktail um you know i tend to go with something you know like you you were asking earlier you know saying earlier that you love that we kind of went with the 94 proof we spent a lot of time thinking about it and you know at at, at one point we were toying with being closer to like 100 proof or, or even 101 because i think troy mentioned on on the previous podcast like we're he and i at least are, are big fans of like wild turkey they make great product sure. for particularly for cocktails like i love wild turkey 101 yeah. to make a you know to make a great cocktail with um but again we were trying to find that nice balance between like not you know not too watered down we wanted it to still have that flavor and so this you know we we played with a few different proofs this kind of ended up being the sweet spot um you know where it still carries those you know, that cherry that you're tasting and the kind of the citrus and some of that oak um, and, and vanilla flavors are still coming through. So, so, so yeah, it's, um, I, I generally drink stuff neat. Um, but if I do make a cocktail, I, <laughs> I'm biased, but I think this makes a pretty good cocktail. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I, I haven't gone that route yet, but I'm uh, probably after we get done. I don't know. May need uh, <laughs> may need to uh, change it up a little bit. So yeah, let's. Yeah, it's definitely got the bones to stand up in a cocktail, and I love the the toasted oak kind of uh, what taste that we get on it as well. So you know, nice job on this one for sure. Um, Thank you. The uh, yeah, we've we've gotten a lot of we've gotten pretty good um, feedback on this. It's. Um, it's, you know, it won gold at the Barley Corn Awards um, earlier this year, or late last year, I guess, earlier this year, whenever the heck it was. Um, last year, it won silver and the, at um, San Francisco World Spirits Awards. And then kind of breaking news for you guys, um, we just got news a couple of days ago that we won double gold, that this product won double gold at San Francisco World Spirits Competition wow. this year. So um, so we're pretty happy with the reception it's had. Yeah, thank you. Um and, uh, and yeah, we, you know, like we think it's approachable and obviously, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been well received. So we're grateful for that too. The werewolves and bourbon is cool too. I like the way you guys did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Well, I'll tell, tell you, Cal, that the thing that Charlie just said about us, you know, kind of maybe going towards a hundred, the beauty of our little team is, um, we, we catch ourselves, right? So we're all a little more advanced and we were, we were starting to go that way is let's make it a bottled and bond a one oh one whatever. Sure. But then, but then, you know, the little, the little, the little devil on the shoulder was like, this is my higher proof, higher proof. Then the little angel on the shoulder, which might've been me or could have been um, uh, Troy or, or Charlie saying, guys, look at there's gonna, people are going to be drinking this that are coming off of an 85 proof, like, you know, a, a right. basil Hayden or something like that. Right. So we, we want them to kind of graduate to this and that's a pretty big of a step. So the four of us collaborate, I'd say that the best thing about our blending team is no one gets their feelings hurt. We can all check each other and, and kind of get to that, that uh, what do we like? What, what will other people like and try to find that, that nice, happy medium. Yeah, Steve. So you mentioned that you, uh, your, uh, I'll call it collection for lack of a better term is kind of more, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, Scotch and Irish and, and Japanese whiskeys. So with the four of you, uh, which, you know, it's pretty, not it's not uncommon to see multiple people on a blending team, right? I mean, you want it for a reason. It's kind of checks and balances, as you as you mentioned. Is there uh, did did you all find that there are you, you have uniquely different palettes, or is there 
some nuances that, yeah, I kind of like, you know, I, you know, I'm maybe going a little on the smoky side, but everybody kind of went towards uh, the leather and, uh, you know, that, that is there, was there any similarities there or is it just polar opposites? I think, I think we, our palates are, are, have a nice um, concentric mix to them. So we probably have a little, you know, no, no two palates are alike, but sure. I think when we write, we, we do our tasting and write our notes in, in secretively. Um, and then we come back together and there's a lot of commonality. We ha- definitely have different tastes though. So we have different preferences of what we enjoy. And that's where the collaboration takes place is that we check each other on, well, we know that's your favorite, but that might not be everybody else's favorite. And I, right. and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, it probably happened a little bit more on the rye than the bourbon. We were probably a little more in sync on the bourbon, Charlie, if I remember. On the rye, yeah. we, we you know, 95% rye versus a 51% rye give you to- totally different flavors. Um, but but I think um, we found that we have pretty common ability to, to, to pick out the nuances in different barrels. Yeah, it's. It, I, I think Steve made a, it like the concentric circles where is is a great way of putting it. And it's one of the things that's great is as he said, we all take no, private notes, and then you all kind of t- take turns comparing after we taste a barrel. And and the thing that's great is often you know one of us or you know one or or some combination of us may love a barrel and somebody else may not. But when we find a barrel that all four of us put a star next to, it's like all right, <laughs> there's a honey barrel. You know, like that's <laughs> one that we know is special. And, and, uh, you know, like either, you know, maybe that, maybe we keep that aside or maybe that's the secret ingredient in the blend is like that barrel. So, sure. so yeah, when, when all four of us like hone in on one, then we know that that's, you know, that's a keeper. And we've got three releases out now, right? We've got, uh, Moonlight Mayhem, Moonlight Mayhem, Extended Cut and Rise of the Robots. Those are, yeah. those are the three. Yeah. yeah. The one you can, the, the, the ones over my shoulder. Oh, there you go. Yep. Uh, yeah. So what I heard Charlie saying was we've got a single barrel project uh, in the works. <laughs> that, 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 uh, am I interpreting anything uh, incorrectly of it? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that's that's um, to trade. We've we've gone ahead and shared that, that we do have a single barrel program. So. So, yeah, later this year, um, again, we're, we have distribution currently in Kentucky and California. So. Um, those those will be the states or those are the states that the single barrels will be offered into. Uh, but, yeah, we'll have a single barrel program that will start to introduce single barrels into those two states. Yep. Nice. Nice. So let's uh, I want to go back to the brand a little bit. And uh, Steve, we'll we'll get once we get into the golf piece, this will kind of tie in. But so, you know, think about I guess it'll be a two part question. Right. But. Think about the bur- what's happened to the bourbon industry. So, I mean, we got a finance guy on, we got a creative guy on, and it's like, hey, it's a good idea to get in the the whiskey business right now, right? It's it it's not it it's it's going to be a good thing just with where the market is today. So, I think one thinking about where what what your take is on the temperature of the uh, of the bourbon world or the market. And then how do, how does a brand stand out when, cause I mean, think about when you walk into a liquor store, right. And you, and you go to the, the bourbon aisle or whiskey aisle. I mean, hell, I don't know, hundreds of options at a minimum, right. Depending on the size of what you're in. And generally speaking, you're going to have different offerings from the same uh, blender or distiller. Uh, that's, you know, maybe that's making your decision, maybe, uh, maybe that much harder, if you will. Uh, but I think what you, what Filmland Spirits has done, and by the way, it's filmlandspirits.com. If you want to go and place an order and order some bourbon, um, it's, there's a, uh, let me think, I don't want to say this. There's, uh, there's a lot of made up stories. How about that? Right. And, and there's a lot of made up stories. There's a lot of fictional stories that may not necessarily be portrayed as fictional stories, right? That it's it, they, they may not say that they're true, but they may lead you to think that. And I, for me, right, and and a, a, I drink daily. Uh, I think that the fact that we, you know, we know that we're getting a fictional story in Filmland Spirits as far as the brand goes. And then again, the most important part, you know, what's in the bottle, but yeah, if you all would share maybe your, your insights on, you know, how do you differentiate and, and how do you, how do you take that bold leap, right? To say here, we're, we're going to roll B list uh, movies as our theme. And uh, that, that's what the, we need a financial guy to back us and say, yeah, good idea. <laughs> go, you can go first, Charlie. 
<laughs> well, the, so the original concept was actually going to be Colonel Steve Canepa, eighth generation <laughs> moonshiner from from the hills of Kentucky. But then we came up with this movie thing, and and you know it just took off. No, um, yeah, you know it was. I I think we previously shared that you know we have this as a you know as a team um, when we were initially thinking about putting this together, we kind of had this love of you know, this, this background and love of film and this, you know, this growing love, um, as a hobby, you know, which became a a profession in whiskey. And, you know, we started kind of mulling around with that. And then at the same time, we looked at the shelves, same as you're talking about, and, you know, you, you, you walk down the wine aisle and there's a lot of fun, interesting, creative labels, right? You go down the craft beer aisle, people are doing all kinds of interesting things with, you you know, with the cans there. And even to a lesser degree with some of, you know, some, some other spirits, like, you know, you hit the vodka aisle and there's stuff in like glass skulls and AK 47s or whatever. And, and so, you know, we, we you know, we, then you turn and you look at the whiskey aisle and it's like, it's pretty traditional, right? It's a bird or a dog or an old man or, you know, like, or, you know, it's just, it's, it kind of has always been pretty traditional and there's a place for that. And we respect it and we recognize it, but we also saw it as an opportunity to put something on the shelf that may be different, may catch somebody's eye and may attract drinkers who aren't already going and buying the bird or the Turkey or the, you know, like whatever it is. Right. Um, and, and so that was, it, it was intentional that we, you know, we wanted to create a label that we thought would stand out on the shelf. The, the, you know, the, the flip side of that is, you know, we know that getting somebody to pick up the bottle by virtue of the label is super important. But if what's inside of it sucks, then that's a one and done. Right. And so, you know, we already talked about the blending process and the awards that we've won. And so it was really important that we were able to validate ourselves with a really solid product, which I think we've done. But um, having a fun, creative, interesting label was one of, you know, was a key tactic to being able to stand out to, to consumers when you do go to a very, very crowded shelf. Yeah, and for me, it was the risk of it being so different was the only way I would have gotten involved. But it's also scary, right? So if it had been um, a pitch that uh, we're either going to source from some reputable places or we're going to build a distillery and uh, release stuff after four or five years and put it in a clear bottle with some gold embossing, I would have said, well, that that has a chance, but it's it's not anything I'd be interested in. But it would have probably been less risky, right? But what attracted me to this was the risk is worth it. It, it has a higher probability of failing with that risk. But if it succeeds, I think it starts opening up a new world where people um, are, are probably at a different demographic who would not typically dabble in a 94 proof whiskey may do so um, because they're attracted to the bottle. Then they taste it and say, well, this didn't taste the way I thought it was going to taste. And, and they'll become repeat customers, but they're also can get engulfed in the story. And the website, you know, takes you way beyond the, the label um, at filmlandspirits.com, as you mentioned. So it was for me to get involved. I needed something that was different. That doesn't make it better. And I'm not in any way criticizing anybody else who's done the traditional route. I, love and respect and drink a lot of that stuff. So of course I have nothing but admiration for it, but for my personal involvement, it had to be different And this. And then Troy and Charlie's passion and knowledge, well, probably knowledge and passion in, in that order. And I, and I say that purposefully, they have a, they brought a lot of knowledge that they've taught me so many things and, and then their passion, it just, it really helped the whole thing. And, and I guess getting back to the, the idea of different people drinking whiskey that hadn't tried it before or, always had to pour Coke in it to get it down. Not that there's anything wrong when they do that sometimes, but always had to do it. Right. Um, that's what I was hoping to get out of this. So to, to sum that up, Cal, Steve just said that the action is the juice for him, like the heat, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I see a putter coming out of the bag pretty soon. And he's, uh, if, you guys, if you guys start talking logistics, I may walk back there, but I'll come back. <laughs> He's thinking, uh, what I needed was a wireless <laughs> microphone. Why the hell did I not think about Bluetooth <laughs> microphone? I could be, uh, I could be traveling around right now and, uh, hit, hitting a few balls. Mm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all really interesting points. I, I think that 
uh, well, so you, we've talked, you've mentioned some other brands or referenced some other brands and kind of wh- where you are. What was your, what, what was your gateway or your, your tap root, right? What led you to, Hey, I want to go and kind of nerd out on this bourbon or whiskey experience. And ultimately I want to get into the whiskey business. What, what, what was the, what was the pour? Uh, gosh, I, I, you know, like the, I'd say the point where I started to become kind of a, a, a real nerd and start collecting and hunting and all of that was, was Boone County. Actually. I love that OG Boone County M- MGP juice Boone County. Ooh. Um, and, and, and back then, so now they distill their own is still really solid, still really like it. But back when they were sourcing, they, they found some really, really high quality product. Um, and I was, I was chasing the, I was chasing the Boone County pretty hard, trying to get my hands on, you know, like anything I could, the older, the better, you know, when we would go to Kentucky, that would be what I'd be going into every shop looking for. Um, and you know, like if I was trawling, you know, online opportunities, not that, you know, or whatever, that's what I was looking for. Sure. Um, it expanded well beyond that. Um, but if you're, you know, like where, what was the gateway? It probably was Boone County. And I, you know, I still love the brand and I still very carefully nurse some of like my 14 year old store <laughs> picks that I have from that old school. Um, like, but, but it also was probably what turned me on to MGP as well. It was probably one of the first brands where I realized, oh, okay, these guys haven't been around long enough to actually have made 14 or 12 or, you know, even eight or 10 year old stuff. Um, where'd this come from? Oh, MGP is a real thing. Let me, let, let me learn more. And then I realized, you know, it, it's a ton of brands are actually MGP and I, you know, right up the street from, from those guys are new riff. And, and back then new riff was putting out some really killer stuff and still is as well. So, so yeah, it, you know, Boone County was probably the gateway drug, if you will, you know, having graduated my way up. And that's when I really started to become a hunter. And you know, go out and spend my weekends and travel around. It's a and all slippery that slope, stuff. man. Once you yeah. once you do it, you're screwed. <laughs> you're well, yeah, eventually, yeah, eventually, you end up pouring your life savings into a <laughs> into a whiskey startup. So, so yeah. <laughs> what it was for me was not so much an individual whiskey. It was the exploration, but it, it was the, the realization that I, I had no idea that big distillers had multiple labels. I didn't, I didn't know that. So I would think, I thought every bottle that had a different name was made by a different person in my, in my uh, youthful naivety of, of whiskey drinking. And then one day we can go down the Buffalo Trace line or the you know, Jim Beam line or whatever, right? One day someone goes, well, you know that, that Eagle Rare you love, that's made by the same people who made Buffalo Trace or that Blanton's you love. And I'm like, no way. And they're like, yeah. And then they show me and I'm like, oh my God, like these, I, and I, I, I started understanding the difference between mash bills and aging and sure. where it sits in the r- Rick house. And, and that's when the, that's when the light went on for me. And, and that was probably seven to 10 years after I started enjoying um, whiskeys that uh, American whiskeys, because I kind of started on scotch and then I made my way over to the, to the Americans. Once that light went on and it just opened up this idea of, of exploring and going on and like going on their websites and going, Oh my God, they make all that stuff. And I like that one, that one, and that one. And I don't like that one. Oh, that one has a different mash bill. Okay. That's what, you know, that's, that was kind of the big aha moment for me. And there's a few, you know, heaven Hill, whatever they, they have these lines that I started appreciating how cool of an industry and how much variation um, there was in it, even within the same company. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so uh, before we before I ask you the next question, uh, I'm going to get into the extended cut. I do believe you all want to share a little about this one. Sure. So extended cut is the same mash bill, uh, just at a higher proof. So kind of the the metaphor that we like to use is when you know when a when a film is released as an extended cut, it often has it, it typically has you know something more, you know more things. So extra scenes, a director's commentary and extend, you know, like, you know, a longer runtime. In our case, um, it, it's more proof, right? So the, the you know, the extended cut um, analogy extends out and it basically means that as, you know, while, while Moonlight Mayhem regular proof is 94, this is coming in at 115. So, so yeah, it, this is, this is the, um, 
product that we made for ourselves, essentially. Right. So when we did, you know, I mentioned earlier, Moonlight Mayhem was intended to be approachable for, you know, great for both, you know, experienced and new drinkers. Um, this is a little, you know, obviously the proof is higher. So it's, you know, it's got a little more warmth to it. Um, we feel like it has a lot more flavor. The flavor profile, you know, brings out many of the, you know, similar flavors that you mentioned earlier, but, you know, a little bolder, a little, a little more, um, you know, a, a little more punch to it. And, and again, it's, you know, like between the two, when I sit down and have something neat, I go to extended cut because it's, I, I am a high proof drink, drinker. So it's what I would go to Steve. Yeah, I think, um, this is my favorite and I'm not just saying that because we're drinking it. I think I might have even said that on our last podcast um, to the point where when we were making the labels, um, I was allowed to have my name on the rye as an executive producer, but I, I begged Troy to put my name on this one too. You're because, on the extended cut too. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I, oh, right. like, <laughs> I, I loved it so much. And, and I think um, this is the one where we didn't compromise uh, um, for other people. We said, this is for a niche. Now this is when we were blending it, right? We sure. knew yep. right away that this is the one we were going to make for advanced Missouri. to our ultimate surprise. It's be it's being well received way beyond what we would have ever imagined. People who, uh, we give all three to and say they're newbies. They drink this and go bananas because they don't feel they get uh, a 115 burn on it and the flavors come pouring out of it. So we've been very pleasantly surprised that our initial idea of making this for advanced bourbon drinkers was still there and I think still valid. But even newbies are um, really appreciating this whiskey and that makes us the most proud. This is one that's won the most awards, gotten the most accolades. This one, this is kind of our, this is our baby right now. So for the Moonlight Mayhem Extended Cut, I, I think what stands out to me most, uh, a, a lot of similar flavors, yes. I think that I start to get a little more kind of chocolatey notes on this mm -hmm. one or cocoa. And, and really, it's the, the mouthfeel, I think, is what, uh, is what really stands out for me, right? I mean, it's again, if we're talking about uh, Moonlight Mayhem, right, at 94 proof, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's got a good taste up front. It's, it's got some mouthfeel. And the finish... I, uh, you know, it's, it's short to medium, right? I mean, I took a sip of this extended cut, like I'm still getting some of that leather, getting a little, a uh, little cinnamony in the, in the back of my throat or the back of my mouth. So uh, I, I think that, I think that's the, the way that you would differentiate in which one do I want to drink today? It's, you know, how much do I want to kind of sip and savor versus, Hey, do I just, uh, you know, I'm time for a quick drink. Yeah. Okay, Cal, I thought I broke my glass here. All the legs on these are just amazing. <laughs> right? it's, it's, like, you know, it's got great depth to it. And uh, I, I can, all the flavors you guys are spot on with your, with your notes there. Fantastic for. Yep. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah we. Yep. Go ahead. You're going to go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 was, I was just going to say, yeah, you know, like Steve said, this is our baby. Um, we, we were really happy last year. This picked up um, this this one gold to San Francisco in the winter edition of um, Whiskey Advocate magazine. They rated it a, a 91 out of 100, which is a great score for, a, you know, especially for a new brand like ourselves. Um, the current issue of, of American Whiskey magazine, they rated a 9.1. Peggy No gave it a 9.1 out of 10. So it's been really well received and we're pretty grateful at, at the reception it's had. Um, and, and yeah, we're super proud of it. Yeah. As you should be. Yeah. A, a couple things. So, uh, again, it's not drinking at one fifteen at all. I think if you, if you go and drink some barrel proof, um, bourbons, uh, you're going to notice, uh, not flavor similarities necessarily, but I, I think you are going to notice, um, you know, some mouthfeel consistency, things along those lines, right. That, that kind of become, uh, that become familiar. Um, yeah, I, this is, this, I'm going to have a, another pour of this. I'm actually going <laughs> to blend the two probably before we get done with this conversation. <laughs> uh, Thanks. Do, do a little blending on my own. So what's, uh, what do we have new to look forward to? I mean, obviously, uh, filmlandspirits.com, you mentioned distributed in Kentucky and California. I think you're at many, many, many 
uh, well, I shouldn't say that you're available online to, uh, to a lot of states. Yeah, so they're over, they're over 40 now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's over 40. And actually, um, earlier today, we learned that they've, that our online partners expanded into a handful of additional states. So we'll, we're going to update the website in the next day or so. Um, nice. but it's, yeah, it's well North of 40 at this point. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You can get this online. You can find us, um, in, in select retailers in California. In Kentucky, we have really great distribution. We're in, you can find us in Kroger. You can find us in Total Wine. You can find us in, you know, most of, many of the, you know, many of the um, better known uh, spirit shops, you know, across the state, uh, particularly in Louisville and Lexington. We're in Bardstown and in, in the places you would expect to see us. Um, and then, you know, to, we're, we are looking to expand. We hope that by the end of this year, our footprint is, um, it you know, hopefully at least three times our, our current footprint. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things that as a, you know, as a new, as a new brand, you kind of work away at, um, and it takes a little bit of time and it takes a lot of effort, but, um, you know, hopefully next time we come on, we'll be able to tell you about all the new States that we're in. <laughs> I, I see that. I see the finance guy over there. He's got, uh, got I don't know if it's a Grant or a smirk that's trying to sneak out there, but it's uh, it, it's that balance, right? And and how do we uh, how do we remain a for profit business, uh, but then you know still achieve uh, achieve growth? So I asked a question a little earlier. I, I want to re ask it. I don't know if I'm if I if I got an answer. So a, as a as a craft blender, I don't know what do you call your craft blender? Is that a fair uh, sure, a, a, craft a craft label, yeah. a craft brand, right? Yeah, I think yeah. brand. Yeah. So what do you think the, what's the, the, the state of the market today? I mean, wh where do you think, cause you know, again, things were really, I mean, I guess they still are booming as far as I can tell. Um, what do you, where's that taking you and, and where do you see this going from? Uh, I mean, is this going to be a situation where we kind of, you know, five years from now, do, are we looking back and it's looking like the, craft what the craft beer market looked like i know it's a completely different process but think about you know 5, 12 15 years ago right i mean you just had uh craft brewery after craft brewery after craft brewery and, and a lot of them are still around and but a lot of them you know there was acquisitions there you know people bringing things on right so it, i mean because it's a business at the end of the day i mean wh where do y'all kind of see this going from a market standpoint yeah so so for me the the indication that it's still going strong is the bulk barrel purchase market to start, right? So okay. that's where that's where my my initial uh, that'll be that'll be the canary in the coal mine for me. If all of a sudden prices start crashing on uh, wholesale barrels, then mm -hmm. I'll start worrying down the line a little bit. But right now, there's no worries there because <laughs> uh, I'm part of the group trying to trying to purchase those. So. Um, mm -hmm. But then what, what I getting back relating to what I said earlier about the reason I got into this was because of the high risk, but high payout. I think like what we saw in Bureau, there's going to be winners and losers at the end of like, when we look back, there's going to be a lot of tries. Sure. Um, the market overall will grow and the big boys are going to keep growing. And then there's going to be some craft like us that succeed, but way more that fail. And that's what happened with beer also. Right. Yeah. And so the reason I, I told you it was worth the risk is I, is I, I think you got to be on one that you have more confidence. It'll be one of those winners, right. And I, and not calling the other ones losers. I, I'm not saying that it's just, it's the law of the market. Um, so I think what we'll say five or 10 years from now is there was that push of a hundred new craft ones and these 20 made it right. And, and a few of them got bought by the big boys and a few of them are still out there independent. And that's kind of what you saw with, with the beer market. Yep. Sure. Yeah, I think we see it a lot in the wine market too, right? I mean, you've got you have artists, right, that are that are making wine. They may not be the best person to run the business, right? So it's kind of that complimentary, uh, you know, what 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 side takes over, and and I guess how do you partner together and work together to, so that it's a successful business? So yeah, and, um, and I and I thought like what the, your point on what we tried to do with our labeling was one of those reasons I think which would set us apart to possibly be one of those winners is of course, what's inside was first and foremost. And I think we've proven with both our own, our own take on it, but most more importantly, independent blinded tastings have proven yeah. that what we did on the inside was pretty good. The outside of it is the thing that we, we hope is the separating factor of getting people to think about our product in two ways rather than just one way. 
right? And I think that's what we're hoping to to be one of those winners five to ten years from now. Yeah, and and Troy and I reckon so Troy and I both have you know have had a number of businesses over the year and years and consider ourselves pretty you know successful business people. Troy probably more so than myself. Um, but we also recognize that, you know, we, to your point, we are kind of the, you know, representing the wacky creative side of this venture. And so we tried to surround ourselves with grownups that, that you know, that could help put guardrails around the thing. So, you know, Steve is, is obviously a, a very important part of making sure that we're, you know, financially, um, uh, you know, staying on, on track financially and managing the, you know, the business side of things well. The, the other two key members of our team, um, our head of sales, Kristen, and our head of marketing, um, Daniel, both have extensive backgrounds in spirits and, and the spirits industry. So, you know, obviously he and I are the kind of the two newcomers, but they've been in the industry, for, you know, and have very long track records um, and have, you know, have been very, very helpful in helping us kind of stay on the rails and make sure that we, you sure. know, we're not doing anything that's, you know, so disruptive that we disrupt ourselves out of business, right? We, you know, we, we, th we think that we're, we're, you know, threading the needle in just the right way. And, uh, you know, kind of to Steve's, I, I would agree with Steve's assessment, you know, we believe that we're in a good position to be one of those craft brands that succeeds um, and, and moves forward and is, you know, around 10, 15, 20, you know, 50, 100 years from now. Yeah, sure. And, and you may have answered, I think you did answer some of this, but I, I guess one question that I had, and, and if there's anything additional you wanted to share, like if, if, if I were looking to Charlie and Steve and saying, Hey, I, I got this great idea. I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to start a brand. Right. And, and I, it doesn't have to be a big brand, but I, but I want to go down this road. I'm going to do it. What, what's the, what surprised you the most could be a way to answer it or what advice would you give to someone that maybe wanted to start a label. <laughs> oh, God. Or I can go to the next question. No, 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 no. no. I, 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 well, I, I can give my opinion. So I'll answer from the operation side. Are we allowed to curse on this thing? Yeah. Hell yes. My answer would be like, what surprised us the most? How fucking hard every single thing is. It, it's like, you know, operationally, you know, it was, and I, you guys got into this a bit on, on the first time we were on the show, but like glass, what a pain in the ass yeah. getting bottles was, right? Like the corks, what a pain in the ass getting the corks was. The bot, you know, like every single thing was just so much harder. The, you know, the licensing. So, you know, especially when we first got started, now it's all kind of coming together, right? We've got a process in place. We've got suppliers in place. You know, we've got barrels. We, you know, like we've got, we've got a pipeline, a logistics pipeline now. But initially, it was all crazy hard and, and everything took way longer and cost more and, you know, like required, you know. Well, you did pick the thousand. best fucking time to start a business in the, you know, the, the history. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, no, you opened the, you yeah. opened the cussing floodgates, Charlie. <laughs> well, that, yeah, there we, there we go. But <laughs> or, or, no, the, so, or the extended cut opened the cussing, cussing yeah, floodgates. It could be. Either, either way. Either well, way. The, <laughs> for me, the big surprise was to everybody who I thought had a reason to keep a bunch of stuff secret and close to the vest has been nothing but nice and forthcoming. And that's the people in the industry oh. and everybody who I thought should have a, a routine machine driven, easy process has been the biggest pain in the ass <laughs> possible. <laughs> it completely juxtaposed what I would have imagined. You know, Charlie mentioned glass, paper, cork, blah, 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 blah. Our current partners are helping us out a lot, but we had to deal with some people b before that, that, weren't quite as easy but the folks that we've met in kentucky and indiana and tennessee who you would think would go i'm not telling you that right. i'm not sharing that they have welcomed us with open arms have been so kind and willing to share and and there's like a a, a a fraternity sorority brotherhood sisterhood whatever you want to call it of of people just who love this and are are open to sharing and and i and i try to figure out why is that and it's because you can't replicate some of this stuff and there's no one who's ever going to make a bottle that that is like extended cut nor should they try they should make their own but i mean there's so many variables to these products that of course they can share because we're not going to be able to do what they do no no chance so we're going to do our own little thing with some good knowledge and 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 the people that we've met along the way who i thought would have been difficult to deal with have been amazing absolutely amazing and it's been one of the most fun things including the two of you guys
Yeah, yeah, we we appreciate well, that, and and as abstract as um, if that's a fair word to use, right? The 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 bottle itself is. I mean, it, there's still some, uh, you know, there there's fundamentals, or or uh, there there's a traditional, you know, what's inside of the bottle is what's inside the bottle, right? And and that's and and I appreciate the transparency as far as you know sourcing and all those things. I, I think that the the market now demands it, right? Or the consumer kind of demands that. I mean, I don't know that it's really an option to not be transparent if you're gonna if you're gonna be successful. So, I mean, the 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 recipe, right, and the ingredients that you all have uh, kind of injected into this uh, into this business, uh, I mean, it looks like it's uh, looks looks like it's a winning winning prospect. So, Not now, uh, you, you know the timing, right? You know, it reminds me that one of the tweets that Cal and I talked about early in, in the pandemic was, you know, as soon as the pandemic's over, I'm finally going to finish that great novel. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, yeah. so is the one thing I thought you were talking um, about, uh, you know, some of the challenges you had and you know the advice you would have, and I think that you know from a from a, a legality perspective and a regulation perspective, you know, Cal referenced craft beer. I think even the spirits is even tougher than craft beer, right? In terms yeah. of yeah. yeah, so that's one of the things. That's a difference, Cal. Yeah. 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 So we're going to get into some fun stuff in just a minute. Um, I know Steve's dying to chat some golf. I'm looking forward to chatting some golf. Are you, are you a golfer, Charlie? I don't recall. I'm, I'm a really bad golfer. So, so oh, yeah. yes but, and no. no. Yeah, Dan sucks too. It's fine. <laughs> you, you, you and Dan, I have a lot to talk about. I'll go, I'll go <laughs> first. first the first <laughs> you, have, you have another question for him? Uh, so it, it's going to kind of tie into uh, the brand a little bit. Um, but my, you go first. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask. So uh, I've been reading lately on the news that apparently this live PGA Tour controversy has uh, sparked some thoughts out of Hollywood. And apparently maybe Will Ferrell will be starring in a new golf movie that is like loosely related to the live PGA showdown. What do you think about that? <laughs> Charlie, do you know what live is? It's this. so guys, <laughs> you, you're like, you're going to mock me, right? Because this is, I'm, I'm going to like show my non golf knowledge, but it's like the Saudi Arabia back thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that's yeah, so, an interesting perspective to hear someone that's not uh, a golf nerd to hear their, you know, what, what's, what's, how have they marketed themselves and, and provided you with insights as to what it is. So that, that's an, I think it's a good take. I, and yeah. yes, that's exactly how it came out. So, so if, if Will Ferrell plays Brooks Kepka, then I think it'll be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so I, I think, I think for, you know, every time there's a revolutionary idea, the resistance to it is is almost automatic. And you guys aren't old enough to th to know about the, you know, the uh, ABA going against the NBA or you know things like that. Like, if there's always people like, what's wrong? They're using red, white, and blue basketballs. What are those crazy hippies doing, right? So there's always this resistance that comes automatically and. And of course, there's varying degrees of political importance, and sometimes there's none at all. This this one has some, and so the automatic reaction to that um, is absolutely predictable and understandable. The more mainstream talk about it, like a Hollywood production with Will Ferrell, the more the sides will come together. And if they, if there's ever, if there's ever a chance of them coming together, things like a Hollywood production with Will Ferrell playing a fun part. Um, uh, maybe someday a competition between the two that's done in the off season or something, those things will take a little time to bring the two together. And all those other times, either the, the rogue league failed or eventually they merge like the old yeah. football leagues, the old basketball leagues, whatever. So I don't, I don't know what will happen, but one, the, if there ever is ever coming together, things like mainstream media, Hollywood, um, other stuff is one of the steps I think that would be necessary to ever bring them together. So it's a step in a direction that could possibly bring these, these groups together at some point. That's, that's an amazing answer. And, um, you know, I've, I've actually read a little bit about it. I've talked to some people about it, the ABA thing, you know, and my understanding is out of that controversy back then is 
that's where the three point shot was invented. And look at what it is now in the NBA. Absolutely. You know, what, what, what can we think of? Like, what's Liv going to bring to the table that is the three point shot of the PGA Tour that we're like, oh my gosh, if it wasn't for that, we're going to forget about it. Right. But it wasn't for this innovation in there. But, you know, definitely make sure that if Will Ferrell does have a movie that you're drinking, uh, your, spirit, <laughs> your spirits when it comes out. I mean, the <laughs> Talladega Nights of Golf, what more could you ask for? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. Talladega yeah. Nights of Film and Spirits. I'd watch that. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so so would I. Uh, so let me do a time check real quick, guys. Um, we good on time? Uh, we we got a hard stop at any point. I mean, we're not going to go past nine, but uh, you I'm know. okay. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Oh yeah, Steve, you're in California. You can, yeah, you, you might see that the sun might come, the Steve. sun might come about right here pretty soon, but. I, I was thinking, Steve's like, uh, of course, this is a great time to do it. I'm taking the rest of the day off. It's called work. <laughs> Steve's day drinking. Uh, it, it yeah. Hey, uh, I'm I'm not complaining uh, or or judging, Steve. Uh, okay, so Steve's let, on with birdies and bourbon tonight. Send him all of your requests for spending. <laughs> <laughs> That is a good point, Charlie. You may want to uh, get some, you know, get get uh, get those those ones you didn't want to hit send on tonight. Maybe the night to hit send. Yes, yeah, it's, it's true, Steve. Right before this call, we got an offer for like a, a handful <laughs> of like really nice finished barrels, but they were stupid expensive. So <laughs> come on, buddy. Okay. <laughs> uh, so hey, while while that's on top of mind, Charlie, thanks for bringing that up. Um, is before we get into more golf, is there anything new that we should expect? For, or do you want to hold that to the end? uh to the end of the discussion uh, no um i mean we can we can uh dodge the topic now <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> <Okay. there's... laughs> no so so troy and i were just in kentucky a few days ago actually doing new blends of all of our core products um so you know so more 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 of our you know the three core SKUs that, that we've been talking about already um we will have a couple of new releases before the end of the year but nice. at the risk of being coy like not not something that we're ready to like get into just yet. Um, I will say though that that if you you know like what you tasted today, if you like what you tasted last time we were together, you're you're gonna dig what we have coming up. Uh, yeah, sounds like I, episode number three. Cal, and I, what I'd say <laughs> is I think we touched on this before, and it's not giving me any way that there's kind of two parallel philosophies. One is continuing the things that we have, and yes. And, We'll try with the barrel inventory we have, if something is really popular and people love it, we'll try to blend to replicate it, right? You can't exactly, yeah. like I said, but we'll do our best. But if we find seven to 10 barrels that we put them together and there's a whole new flavor, we're going to have a whole new movie concept, a whole new set of characters. We'll do. So we have these kind of parallel paths that are always ongoing continuously. And, and, and we're not, we don't have a schedule we're trying to meet when we, you know, when our bear bottles run out, that's a schedule. But in terms right. of new stuff, it's really, this is worth releasing to the public um, in a new concept. So let's get it out there. So, and, and we always have both of those happening at the same time, continuing and, and um, creating new stuff. They're, they're going on constantly. Yeah, Steve and Charlie, you've mentioned it too. I think, that, you know, it's very, uh, I mean, it ties back to a, as a, a bourbon or whiskey drinker. I mean, what I want to hear, it's like that the first, the first thing, the most important thing that's occurring here is what's in the bottle going in the glass that I'm drinking. And then we'll build, I don't that the concept's the right word to use. We, we'll yeah. build the theme around the bottle, right? Absolutely. Or around, around what's inside the bottle yep. that it's not, yep. I don't need to tell my story. I need to get this out in front, you know, into somebody's glass, and then the you know they, they'll be able to tell the story or, or uh, engage, right, and involve themselves in the story as they kind of work their way through the bottle. So yeah, I, I, and, yeah, I think it's cool. And and with those stories come different producers, right? So we we we, all, we were very open about the fact that our first set here came from MGP. That's not the only place we own barrels from, and that's not the only place we're going to source from. We we taste barrels from all over and are open to, to blending things together from great producers all over the place. So, so the things you'll see in the future won't necessarily be like what you've, what we have right now. Yeah. Good. Good to hear, man. I, I like it. All right. So I'm going to talk some golf stuff real quick. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Uh, not, not real quick. It may not, it may not be quick. Charlie, if you're like, uh, I don't want to screw around with these people anymore. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, just pour another, Charlie, pour another drink. Charlie loves hearing me talk about golf. I know that from my right. Kentucky trips when he falls asleep in the car. Uh, there, there you go. <laughs> now, if, we see, if we see Craig from Dynaline in the background over there, he's going to 
<laughs> exactly. So, uh, so y'all watch the Masters, right? Or, or you saw, you were aware that the Masters happened. Does every year, except for one when it occurred in in same time of year, when it occurred in November haphazardly. But so, what? What's um, so one? Are you happy with the winner or the outcome there? I mean, was was John Rahm, John Rom the right guy? Is he? Is that is that a good thing for golf? And then kind of behind him, you've got Kepka, you got Phil Mickelson. I mean, you got a lot of folks that were questionable about whether they were going to be there or not. And uh, Charlie, just so you know, that when when the folks split off from the PGA Tour and went to live, they basically got a cease and desist, right? Hey, you're, you're no longer going to be able to engage in in our uh, our little fun time anymore. And uh, the majors have said, hey, this is our tournament. And or, or Augusta said, this is our tournament. And the others have followed suit. So, so Steve, what's your take on, on that whole live dynamic there? And is it good for golf? Is it bad for golf? Do we need more of that? I mean, what, what, what you think? Well, I, I thought it was good to see the people, the, the best players in the world together again, it, just on the same playing field, you know, course, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it just was good to see them competing against each other. And, I think about the Ryder Cup coming up and that the idea that some of the best Americans and some of the best Europeans won't be in it is very sad. Um, but a lot of the great Europeans, <laughs> including John Rahm, and a lot of the great Americans, um, uh, obviously, and Rory, and uh, great Americans will be in it. So it'll still be an amazing event. I think the Masters for me is always a, a horses for courses um, thing. I mean, you see that the players that play well there all the time and Phil's finish there was 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 amazing but i think the thing about john rom that shocked me was that a right-handed fader of the ball could win the masters wow was yeah. pretty cool right because the lefties have done so well there because they could fade sure. around a lot of these these corners that the right-handers have to hit a draw and but rom is so precise with his fade it's 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 amazing and you know and and when dj won it uh, in a little softer conditions, he was pretty precise with his fade too. But typically, and Charlie, I know this is right up your alley talking about fades and, and draws and golf. Drink, <laughs> drink more, Charlie. Just but, drink uh, more. But I thought, I, I mean, John Rom's fade, you know, we, we think of our fades. They're like 20-yard fades. His is about a three-yard fade. And he knows he knows exactly where to start it and where it's going to end up every time. And he he played amazing. I mean, he, just, he played absolutely amazing. And I think the the history of Seve and Jose Maria now him winning it is just it's it's cool for the country of Spain and he's carrying on a, a tradition there that's that's kind of hard not to feel something about so you watch a lot of golf and and in getting back to filmland spirits right and and there's a scripted theme that's kind of going is that where you're heading down there there's a scripted theme that's going down this line and you know think about um, they, you know, live. They took all the. I, I don't know if villains is the right. What they took all the personality from the PGA Tour, right? In, in my opinion, and, and my opinion doesn't count for anything. But me as as a fan, that's kind of what I see. Is they they took all the controversy, all the noise out of. I mean, I don't know if there's anybody other than who like Billy Horschel. I can't stand to watch him and Nick Watney's all twitchy over there doing weird things. So a lot of people that I just can't get it, get into, but it, it's the, the, do you think it's scripted? I mean, because really, I mean, like it's Seve's uh, anniversary. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's all kind, how much of this is scripted? <laughs> I, 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 I can't imagine it could be. I just, it's too, there's too many variables to control to script it. Um, I mean, the things that people are accusing of being scripted, like the NBA playoffs, making sure things go to get seven. There's not as many variables, especially with a referee sitting there, but in golf, sure. it's, it, it, it's just um, with the, the weather conditions and um, uh, there's, you know, there's no, there's no external source calling things out. I think it's, I think it just happened. I don't, I don't think it's scripted. So, I, so I do just, I. Yeah. yeah. So do I, but I, I think it's almost, I think live it, I think the PGA tour might be looking at it as it's a, it's a controversial, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bad thing. And I think it's kind of what's fueling a lot of what's not happening now on the PGA tour. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. We, we talked about the, the uh, revolutions in different sports and then the innovations that come out of them. 
if the innovation that comes out of live is a little more music, a little more vibrancy, a little more 16th at PPC uh, uh, Scottsdale vibe. If that's the the uh, innovation that comes out of this, a little more fieriness, a little more personality, or quicker play, <laughs> a little speedier play. If all those are the innovations that come out of this, I think it'll be healthy for for the game. Because when you mention um, the things that have gone away from the PGA Tour, uh, you definitely got a little bit more camera time spent on caddy player conversations about club selection than I think we all want these days. Yeah, on there, there, there's one key group in there. So if you, if you want to go ahead and go down this, go, go down this road. And I'm not going to maybe, maybe, maybe Charlie will mention it. Charlie, who do you think the most influential golfer is today on the PGA tour? And you can't mention, and it's not to don't, Tiger Woods is out of the ballpark. I this mean, that, a that, question for Charlie. That, that's, that's a, a whole <laughs> different, uh, oh, I, I, I think it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, if you had to well, say who the most influential player was, who would you say? It, well, you just, you took my, my best guess off the table. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, now I feel handicapped. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm exposing my ignorance, but I don't know. Okay. All right. All right, no, but neither do I we. Think, neither do we. Yeah, I think it, I think right now it's Rory because of See? of what what he's he put himself out there. Whether you agree with him or disagree with him, I always have respect for someone who states how they feel about a topic and states it with um, fact when facts are true, and then admits when things are emotional. I don't like when people use emotion and portray it as fact. Rory didn't do that in his whole in his whole statements about pga versus live he said when he said what he things that were facts and then when he said i feel this way it was very obvious that that was his emotions and he didn't try to couch those as factual things and and he definitely rallied um the leadership of the pga tour to do things a little differently for their players and i don't think it would happen without him so i think it's right right now it's i think it's him so we got to get you another Monday, uh, another Monday day drinking. We can disguise your identity <laughs> or personality because there. I, I agree with some of the things that you said. There, there are some of the other, other things that we we don't need to get into on this show. But I, right. I would I would love to uh, I'd love to go down this road with you on 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 some of those statements. I don't disagree that Rory is influential to the PGA tour. He absolutely is. And he has, he is kind of the, he's, he's taken over, right. The, the Tiger Woods role of kind of being o overseeing, right. Uh, what the, the PG, the commish, uh, uh, you know, in, the, in, 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 in John, waiting. He's, so he's a John yeah. Mayer, John Mayer of the PGA tour. <laughs> Maybe. I, I'm medicinally speaking, I think uh, he lives in Florida, so I don't, I don't know if yeah, we can. Clapton, uh, hand of the baton, the mayor, just like, you know, yeah. Uh, real quick, before we get up the Masters, um, Steve, Phil's won six majors. Was his Masters finish this year in his top five finishes of all time? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so because I think the course, I, I, I think his – his Brit, his uh, I, I I still say British Open. I can't say that anymore. The Open Championship sure, finishes yeah. where the courses weren't designed for him and aren't his, uh, his cup of tea, uh, and he had to hit shots that he didn't normally hit. Some even the ones he didn't win. The the one the two he lost to Darren Clark and uh, Henrik Stenson, I thought were even more impressive than his second place. Here. Wow! Uh, it's yeah. just it's just coming off the cuff, Steve. Or you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, oh, we... totally off, totally <laughs> off the cuff. Yeah, it's I... the moonlight mayhem talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and the reason is because at the Masters, he knows every single shot, every single green. It's played on the same venue every single time he's played it. That's why I, it's impressive. Please don't get me wrong; it's totally impressive. But top five, when he's playing courses in a in a tournament that rotates uh, in conditions that he's not used to on surfaces he's not used to hitting shots he's not used to those those two second place finishes were were more impressive to me um yeah. than than this one was but it was very very impressive and i mean his his win at the pga a couple of years ago was yeah it, it was it was so um astounding for old farts like me to see something like that happen so that's number one to me oh wow uh, 
Yeah, well, that's I, yeah, I, I could see that. I mean, he's the oldest major champion, right? So yeah. I mean, that's uh, I mean, that's impressive uh, against the field that uh, you know, and and I would say he already knew, and it and it was already in the works of where he was going uh, the next year. So you, I mean, think, that, so you think he knew it then? I mean, I don't think that's an overnight decision. Yeah, uh, um, you're you're a finance guy. You're not. No, making, I, I I don't disagree. I just hadn't thought about it, but yeah, I mean, no, you you're not making six figure. Uh, you're not making nine figure decisions that you didn't think about for an extended, yeah, not cut, but period he, of time, pun intended. Like late summer, right? And then he did the interview that um, got blown up yeah. in football season the same year. Yeah, it was in the same year. But back to my scripted part. I mean, think yeah. about the think about the Brooks and the Bryson shit that went on, and they're yeah. you know the, with the with the cleats, you know the the metal cleats in the background, and Brooks is rolling his eyes over here when he's giving <laughs> yeah. the interview. I mean, there was so much stuff, man. They, I mean, <laughs> if it if it wasn't scripted, then well, the, the hug at the Ryder Cup was scripted. I know <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. that was definitely written on a piece of paper. You will hug it. 507 p.m. <laughs> In, indeed. So, do you think they're the live guys? Do you think they're going? I mean, right now they're out. What I don't know that they're out. I think it's questionable because I think the Ryder Cup is going to look at this as it is not necessarily a PGA Tour sanctioned event. It's American based players. So there, there's a chance that they play. If you had to go, I don't know if either of you are, uh, Charlie, are you a better? You a gambler? Uh, I'm, I'm like, almost as bad of a gambler as I am a golfer, but yes. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, so, I mean, over, under, right? I mean, I think it's on the over side that the live guys might actually get some, um, I, I saw it in person. I saw Zach Johnson walk up and hug Bubba Watson, which I don't think Bubba will make the Ryder Cup. I saw him hug Brooks Kepka. I saw him hug... Uh, Dustin Johnson at Augusta National on a Tuesday afternoon. And you would have thought that they were, I mean, you know, this just as chummy as chummy could be. So I think if you got captain's picks and you can pick anybody that's a professional golfer, I mean, I, I don't know why it wouldn't be a thing. Yeah, whatever I put the odds at, I would, I put them a lot better now than I did before the Masters seeing what you saw, seeing yeah. Rory and Brooks play a practice round together, right? I mean, before the Masters, I would have said no, but I'm open to the idea of it possibly happening now. And I agree that it's different governing bodies so they can make the call they want. I, I just thought that whoever makes that decision would have said no earlier. And they saw what you saw and their, yeah. their, their mind has opened up to the possibility more now after, after what you witnessed. So you were at the Masters. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was there a few days. Uh, but yeah, so but it, it's well, it's down the street. I don't know. Yeah. Charlie, maybe maybe next year. It's uh it's next on year. That, 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 could, that could be a date for us. You never know. Charlie, you don't have to be a golf <laughs> fan to enjoy that event. It is that, spectacular. That, yeah, it is that, it you'll have that time is in your life. Very that's very what I've been told. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so let's do so I got a couple so I, just to be respectful of time here. Um sure. d- is everybody good or we need yeah. uh yeah, All we're good. still good. We're good. If okay. While we're talking golf. We- well, uh, so here here's where I'm going. So I so I'm going to name some names. Um and Charlie, you can just wildly guess as to the commonalities that these individuals have could have to do something with a, a with a brand, not not your brand in particular. Um, let's see. We get Jason Kokrak, Max Homa, uh, That's Jimmy common. Walker. Uh, who else do we got? That's uh golfer Justin band, Thomas. uh, Justin Thomas. So, so there's four golfers and wh- whether you know them or not, Charlie, what do you think those four golfers have in common? It could have something to do with a, uh, a logo or a brand that they wear on the shirt. <laughs> Uh, so just going to guess here, I, by the way, I appreciate the uh, effort in trying to include me in the golf talk. Uh, they, uh, they're all sponsored by Nike. I'm just guessing. I have no idea. Bourbon companies. Really, honestly. Bourbon, bourbon companies. Oh, really? Yeah. No so, shit. Yeah. So we got, and we got Elijah Craig, we've got Eagle Rare, we've got, uh, Chicken Cock, uh, Kevin Kisner, just, uh, right. they a new, new signing there. They're all over social media. 
uh, who'd you say? Who's JT with? Knob Creek? Woodford Reserve. Woodford, yep, with, with Woodford. And there are several others that, that are out there. So I, I guess my question, uh, since I got the finance guy on here, and I, <laughs> I got the creative mind on here, one of the creative minds, uh, what what's your take on um, celebrity? And, and we could go farther, right? And, and I, we don't need to talk about other spirits. And we can just stick with uh, with, with brown liquor and it's, you know, Matthew McConaughey. I mean, there, you can go down the road, uh, but what's your take on celebrity, uh, influencers, endorsements, uh, not to be confused with the birdies and bourbon podcast, but by the way, when we will talk about an affiliate link shortly, uh, but I, I mean, I'm just saying like, what's your, like when you get to that celebrity status, right? When you're a pro, when you've got pro or professional by your name and, and you're one of those, what, what do you all think about that? And what, what does that do for you? And I think two sides is one in your business role if you want to exploit or expose that but then personally does that steer you in any direction yeah so i guess i'll go first steve the you know it's funny because of the fact that we you know we we are a hollywood brand right we're we're la based we've you know we've um you know got this filmatic theme to all of our products we've we've been asked both by um both in conversations like this, as well as, you know, investment conversations and then things, you know, is the intent or how do you guys feel about, you know, celebrity association or endorsement or ownership or any of that kind of stuff specific to us. It's not, it's not necessarily what, you know, what, what we've tried to position ourselves as a brand. We've tried to make up these outrageous things, right? Like these made up characters and these made up you didn't um, try. You, and, you didn't try. Right? You, well, you did it. Right. it so we've made up these, you know, these outrageous, you know, fictional characters, and and that's our brand. So we we don't for ourselves, we don't necessarily see that. As far as other brands go, you know, I think that look, I, I'm I'm not a hater. I would never hate on any brand, right? I think that um, regardless of whether it's you know what the spirit is, or you know, even if it's beer or wine or whatever the case may be. I think when it's um, when it's genuine, right? Like when the celebrity is actually involved creatively in the process, right? Like if you believe, um, you know, if you believe the video when you go and tour Wild Turkey um, and, and all of the material that went with it, like Matthew McConaughey was their chief creative officer and he was deeply involved in product development for like Long Branch, for example, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I think that if, um, yeah, I think, you know, Look, if you've got a passion, that's where it came from. For me, I just happened to not be a celebrity, right? But I was somebody who had a passion. Yeah, don't sell ended, yourself short, Charlie. <laughs> and ended up in the whiskey business. So I think that, you know, if whatever, um, you know, Darius Rucker is passionate about whiskey and bourbon or whatever and goes and creates backstage or whatever, then good on him. And and I think it's, it's, it's great and genuine. Um, you know, celebrity endorsement, like, I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to like bag on it or anything, but I just, I think it's slightly different. It's, you know, a little bit of a different position. It's really just them lending their name as opposed to them being, you know, like truly being a part of the process. Um, and, you know, there are certainly plenty of brands that have, that do that and do that effectively <laughs> and do it again, you know, like even for fictional or dead, like there's John Wayne whiskey, right? Like there's, uh, I think there's a J.R. Ewing whiskey, right? Like it made up character from Dallas, you know, 30 years ago or whatever. But there's an audience for it. There are people who are enthusiastic about, you know, Terry Bradshaw and are going to buy Terry Bradshaw, you know, bourbon or whatever. Um, so good on them. And, you know, there's a there's a time, there's a place and there's an audience for it. Um, but but again, you know, like for me, I, you know, I, I love when any creator um, that's making a product is, you know, it's born of passion um, as much as anything. I think Steve's Googling, my... uh, Steve's Googling <laughs> golfers over here and he's wondering who can we sponsor, right? Who can we sponsor? Who we got? For, for me, the, the, uh, when I told you earlier, there's going to be some winners and losers. The, the, the one, one of the reasons that gives me confidence that we're going to be one of the winners is our team. So any celebrity to me, I don't care how famous they are. If they don't fit with our team, I don't, want them involved there. if they if they or their people were disruptors to our team environment because we all march to the same beat 
Now we have differences of opinion, but we never let that hinder us um, continuing on this path that we're on. If someone came in and was C, B, or A level uh, personality in movies or sports, golf particularly, is they if they can fit into this team, I'd welcome them with open arms. They got the concept, they got the idea, they understand it, they knew their place. But if it was some name who had their assistants, assistant, assistants tell us that they can only talk from 257 to 302 and we can only talk about this and we can't mention that, they wouldn't be part of our team and it would be a hindrance to what, to what we're doing going forward. So um, I'm open-minded to anything, but, but to me, that's the number one thing is they need to fit into our vibe, not us, you know, bowing down to whatever, whatever they had. Um, sure. uh, and, and I think it could be, I mean, there could be that perfect fit of, 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 uh, of uh, Adam Sandler or Shooter McGavin joining <laughs> us. It would be fantastic. <laughs> Hey, uh, you know, if that if that happens, uh, we we don't need royalties. We, we just we just need booze. We just need booze. <laughs> we're, we're, <clears throat> as long uh, as you guys have us on in taste with us, you're going to get a, an offering of everything uh, we have. Yeah, well, we we got to be respectful of your time, so we uh, we we, we got to make sure we don't keep you. And I mean, who knows? The drunker I get, who I've knows only got I'll one say, more question, Cal, so. and then we got to wrap up. All right, one more, one yeah, more, and then I've I've got, got a go. handful. There's, they're too nice to tell you that they're out of time. So um, I'll stay so, with you all night. Don't worry about uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the U.S. opens in L.A. this year. Yes. Who, who you got? Who you glad got? You, well, first off, I'm glad, glad you brought that up because I'm so happy the world gets to see that golf course. Okay. It is. It is. It, in itself, it's a work of art. You guys are going to enjoy seeing it on television. Um, I mean, it's just it's hard to go against – Scheffler or Rom and anything right now. It's hard. To, it's hard to bet against either one of them. I mean, my my heart is with Xander Shoffley because I went to San Diego State, but mm. um, but it's it's Scheffler and Rom are just have separated themselves from the pack a little bit. Uh, Sad day, I, Steve. We got to throw a side wager up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your, who who do you got? Well, I, I mean, I'm going to take the field if you're going to go with Sandy. Oh, I, <laughs> I'm not. I, I said that's where my heart is, not where my wallet is. <laughs> yeah, my, my Aztecs uh, got to the championship game in the NCAA, and that was a cool thing to see. And to see Xander win a, a major would, would be pretty pretty sweet. Of which I'm a Xander fan. I didn't mean that negatively. I just no, think I there's, I, yeah, there, there's yeah. lots of uh, – I don't know if Xander's a closer. I, yeah, I think – yeah, he it's it's in, in final rounds he hits one or two bad drives which 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 hurt him and and the other guys don't seem to do that but I mean the thing that the thing that's going to serve him well there is his short game and he's going to need it because um, I think that's that's the guys who who don't have really good touch around the green and on the green are going to struggle there it's it's subtle breaks it's really it's you guys are going to love seeing that U.S. Open there. Interesting. So Cal's taking Phil. I'm, um, I'm t- <laughs> well, I mean, so Steve, to your uh, comment earlier, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I did. Ha- I played a few people. I'm we're right, draft Kings guys and all that shit. So we, you know, we did throw some people and betters, right? We threw some stuff out there for, for some of the live guys. I think it was more like, eh, nobody, uh, not a lot of other people are doing it. I'll venture down that road, but man, did, did they kind of let something shine? I mean, you've got, who Kepka two time uh o- two time US Open champion, two time PGA champion. Yep. Uh DJ, I mean he's uh, he can get around a US Open course. D is probably the one I'm out on totally. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's I, th- there's whatever's going on. And by the way, when I saw him at Augusta, uh and, and I did see him at it was armed, they don't let me get close to him anymore. Uh, it, I have to be arm's length away. <laughs> but he but he looked a hell of a lot smaller than he ever than he's ever looked since uh, since the weight gain. So I, oh, yeah. I don't know what's yeah. I mean the comp- yeah, real small, not small like me, but uh, but yes. I mean he he like I'm talking like a significant weight loss. Uh, not not in the bad. I don't think he's unhealthy. I just think that there's you know could have been things that were happening that aren't happening now. That yeah, uh, driving accuracy will be at a premium. So I'm not sure he, he had a had a year or two there where he can drive it straight, but he kind of lost that when he went started going on the long drive. Uh, yeah. I'm leaning Homa. I'm leaning Homa. On no, the, that'd be, that'd he, be awesome. 
e- even though like a recent form hasn't been great, but, uh, but I, I'm leaning Hummus. So uh, we got two more. Let's uh, let's hit on these, which I try to make it quick. Well, sure. You, um, what about uh, the PGA championship? It's going to be played at Oak Hill. Mm. Um, and we got the open championship. that's going to be played at Royal Liverpool. What, what do you yeah. think of there? Yeah. I mean, I, I, we talked um, earlier about the Grand Slam. I mean, th- to see Jordan win the PGA would be pretty sweet to complete the career Grand Slam. So that's what I'll be rooting for. Um, he seems close. He seems almost there. And, he, and when he talks, uh, it, it seems like his, his pre-shot routine isn't as exaggerated as it was, which seems to, to indicate he's getting more and more comfortable with the new swing. So that's who I would hope at, at PGA. Um, I'm not very familiar with Royal Liverpool, so I'm not sure what the course is like. It's not one of the ones that I have um, in my mental memory bank. So um, yeah. to me, I, when I when I get a, when I get a feel for the course, then I can kind of think about more of the golfer. And I think the the Jordan pick at PGA is just sentimental. So I think I, it would be cool for him to to, to complete the slam. Um, but yeah, I, when you get to the Open, that to me the Open. Uh, championship always brings people in who you don't expect a little bit more than the other ones do. So once I, I, I think I'll get a better feel for that. Once I get the golf magazine that lays out the course and talks about the course a little bit, then I'll start thinking about the open a little bit more. That may be episode three or four. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Extended episode. At, at, at that it, point, it, so. We got to release whiskey soon, Charlie. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you got samples, you know, of, of non-production things that uh, you can't send to us, but that we could be drinking while we're talking, I mean, we don't, we don't have to say what it is. We yeah. Just say it's a, uh, the, experimental batch from yep. uh from filmland spirits uh I, damn what do you got man we we got to get we got to let these guys go at some point so i i have a joke for off the air but i don't have anything else on there <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, uh, no, i'm intrigued so i know it's like are you sure you don't want to put it out there maybe maybe we'll do a blooper later <laughs> uh let's see okay so let's do a, a top five rundown so charlie her understood and heard you don't have to be a good golfer to go play golf and have a good time and and drink uh drink good whiskey or bourbon on the golf course uh steve i don't know he's got a putting green in his backyard if i play with him and he's not like just draining every fucking thing like it's gonna be it, i'm gonna like I, i'm gonna want to know what's I'm, going on here i'm a i'm an eight index and that is a All 20 right. from the tees and from the fairway and scratch from around the green that's oh. how i got to my that's how i got to my eight <laughs> So, so for you guys, uh, for Steve and Charlie or Charlie and Steve, however, whatever order you want to do it in, um, what's, so maybe you, we can do, you can do top three, you can do top one, top five. If we get into top 15, it's going to lead to more time and booze. Uh, but give me, give me like a top five ish, uh, of your favorite courses that you've played or favorite that you're going to play. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Steve go on this one. You don't want to go. You want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been fortunate enough to play what I two of the big three. So I've played Cypress and Pine Valley, so they're definitely in there. Haven't played Augusta. Um, so Cypress number one, Pine Valley number two, uh, and and I grew up in Monterey, so I have it's a biased opinion on Cypress being number one. Do you have a connection? Is um, what you're saying? Uh, I don't. I had I had one, but I don't on a regular basis. The Pine Valley, my first boss at my last company's father was a member, um, mm. so I was able to get on there, which which was a great experience. Number three would probably be, um, I think LACC, which the Open's going to be at coming mm, up here. Nice. Uh, great course. Number four, let's go out to kind of your neck of the woods. Um, Maybe a Kiowa Ocean, Ooh. pretty good. And then number five up in Kohler, Whistling Straits. I haven't made it up there yet. I, I got to get up there. That's uh, that's uh, uh, definitely uh, on my or, list. or Pacific Dunes and Bandon. That's a that's it's one of those two. Yeah, I, I can tell you. I I, I did play band. I was at Bandon last November, and holy shit, what a golf experience, man! Yeah, I mean it just. It, Can I have a tie it, for fifth place then? Those two. Charlie, what you got? 
You play Pinehurst? Yeah, I haven't yet. That's on my bucket list is get out to Pinehurst and have a, a little, a little, a, a week of fun with the boys. Uh, bring some bourbon and we'll, uh, we'll get that set up. We, uh, we may know some people there. All right, brother. Meet you there. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that I have an intelligent top five list because I, the golf that I've played has usually been with, you know, people who have taken me somewhere and it's never been anywhere special like Steve was, was saying. So, you know, for me, if, if I pick a top five, it's going to be like Pirate's Cove, uh, put, put, put and scoot, um, <laughs> like <laughs> top, top golf in Midtown is it, definitely up there. Right. Um, no, the, like the closest thing to anything remotely cool that you guys would care about is in, I, I used to live and work in China and in China, there's a course and it was beautiful. And I couldn't tell you the name right now to save my life. But it basically the, you know, doing and got, you know, I love China, but the Chinese doing what they do very effectively had built an 18 hole course that each hole was a replica of like a classic hole from, you know, like, like world leading golf courses all over the sure. world. So, you know, like one looked like, you know, it was in the Hawaii. 12th at Augusta. Say the 12th right. at Augusta, you'll impress everybody. The, the 12th at Augusta. And, the, <laughs> and, and so, um, so the guy who took me was super impressed. I just thought it was really pretty and super hard, but, but, uh, yeah, I apologize, but, uh, yeah. No yeah, apologies, yeah, man. No need. No need. The, uh, but my, my golf experience is generally uh, in my lifetime has been like work events where they're like, all right, come on, we're going to have a golf outing or, or, or with friends. And it mostly involves a lot of drinking, a lot of like me slicing or hooking or both. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, like me just doing really poorly golf is super intimidating to me. And I'll tell you why as like the novice, uh, like the non golfer of the crew, it's because it's really, it's a hard sport to start. Not, not, not just because of the expense, but because really good golfers are super intimidating and non impatient. And so like, if you just want to go out and you're like, let me, let me go out and like hack around the guys like y'all that are really good are going to be like, Jesus that's Christ. Urban, that's, that's urban. That's urban. It, it, yeah, that is I, not true at all. That is so not <laughs> I, 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 I think stirred it up. <laughs> no, I, I think this gets back to the, oh, well, you can only have your whiskey on the rocks or you can only have your whiskey uh, neat or you can't put Coke in your, uh, in, in your Jack Daniels. And, and, and I agree with Steve totally that that's urban myth. And I think that if, you, if there's a, uh, the dynamic is, is, hey, at some point, Charlie, pick your fucking ball up and let's go yeah, on. It's only it, pace, Charlie. Right. Not, qual <laughs> it's not like, quality. To, We've yeah, seen no, the no. worst things you could ever imagine in your life more times than you could ever imagine. We don't care about bad golf. We care about pace. We play music. We smoke cigars. We drink whiskey. We have fun. Oh, there is yeah. nothing about bad shots. It's about you've taken 11 shots. Just pick up and let's move on to the next one. Ooh, I was, I was well, thinking I'm, at seven. You're picking it up. I'm, so. I'm with you. I was, I was, I was being a little, yeah. So it's for, for, the, for avid golfers, it's pace of play, not quality of play. All right. Well, then count me in next time. Any of the three of you want to go uh, play some, have have some bad golf played with you. Let Absolutely. me know, and, and I'm in. Absolutely. We, we got to make it a point to get to Sweetens Cove, man. It's a. It, it's, I don't know if you, uh, Steve, you yeah, may I have just, heard of I it. I just so. saw. No, I just saw YouTube on it last night. Uh, the uh, um, some YouTube golfers. I've heard Busted Jack. Have you seen Busted Jack? I don't know. Busted they have a, Jack. They have, a, they, have a, they have a YouTube channel, and they they're playing with the pro at Sweetens Cove. What an amazing place. So there's, there's two pins on every green. So you can play 18 if you want, but then the greens have these huge swales in them and they're, just, Oh, and, oh and, but, the, but the layout looked amazing. Yeah. It's, it's fucking disgusting, man. I yeah. mean, it is, it, it's, uh, and they had to you, take a shot before they started. Is that tradition? Oh yeah. Well, you, you oh, don't yeah. have to, but the tradition <laughs> is, and if you don't, it's going to be a rough rest of the day because there's little chances you're showing up there and playing 18 holes. <clears throat> You're probably going to play 36 or I, mean, I, yeah. I, I played a hundred holes there one day that, that, that was, that, yeah. that's a, that's a different conversation. Is for it, a, it just, is it sitting a little bit of a valley? Cause it just it, looked like the Sequatchie like Valley, in, man. Uh, yeah. Really, it, it's it in the gorgeous, gorgeous. Yeah, Sequatchie cool. Valley. Uh, cool. Correction, Cal. Like, but if you're the CFO of a whiskey company, you do have to take a shot before you start there. Oh, right? that's, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good well, point. yeah. I mean, if you, I would think it's something per hole something right 
Oh, the, yeah. I, I've, I don't know when I've showed up there without multiple bottles of uh, a bourbon or whiskey in some form or fashion. And uh, if you play, allegedly, they have members. Allegedly. I, I don't know. I've yet to meet one. But if you do meet a member, they have these little secret cubby holes around on uh, some of these holes that you don't, you may not have to drink your w- liquor that you brought. Ah. You might be able to go to the little cubby hole of here and, uh, or the honey hole or the, yeah, and, and drink. That somebody. sounds like a perfect place to stash some extended cut, huh? Uh, doesn't it? Uh, yes. M- multiple bottles is exactly right. what it sounds like. Yeah. I, th- I think it fit in great. Uh, all right, guys. Um, what, what else we got? Pl- uh, player of the year, Steve. Player of the year. So, so far, Rom. Yeah, I agree. Three, three victories, a Masters. Yeah, so far, Rom. So far, Rom. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I can't argue that it's not going to be, I mean, he's going to have the Scotty Scheffler theme of, uh, if he's not, Rory better be careful. He's going to lose his, uh, lose his crown. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, someone, if someone wins, one in the tour championship or two majors, they can take it from a more, a ton of regular events. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of his, his at the halfway point here. Almost Spieth, could, point. Spieth could pull it off. Right. I mean, if Spieth wins, if, if Spieth finishes uh, his career grand slam in, at, in Oak Hills yep. or Oak Hill, and then uh, he can say he has got a great track record at yep. the at the open. I mean, he he could win two majors and, uh, yep. and, and that, walk that, away with it pretty handily. I think that I think so. it would take something like that to 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 kind of take it to surpass Rom at this point. And Scheffler could do it too. I mean, there's people who have a chance, but right, he's he's in the in the lead at the moment. I think these California Lockley. guys, California Lockley. guys, uh, chumming <laughs> it up with uh... last one. All right, so in 25 years, Steve. Yeah. We've had, uh, who is who's in the Faldo chair? Because we've we've seen Phil in the booth, Rom was in the booth, Rory's like the commish now, little little commish. Um, you got Homa out there. Like who's in the Faldo chair in twenty five years? I think you just named him. I think it's Max. I mean, he's got this. Ooh. He's got this vibe that connects with so many people, right? Like he can connect with the young guys because he's got the YouTube vibe and the and the Twitter vibe. But then people my age, I, I, he's got a, he's got an old soul to him too. At times, like he's got this ability to connect across generations that, that not everybody has. I, I think, I think it's Max. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. I like him. Awesome. All right, Dan. Let's get these guys out of here. Uh, they've okay. got better stuff to do, and uh, we might. We, actually, we do want to have them back on again, so we don't want to uh, ruin our reputation more than it's already been ruined. Uh, Everything you did today made that more possible. You guys are awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. Steve Canapa, Charlie Flint, uh, tell people where they can find film land spirits. And uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, so in store, come look for us in, in front of stores in Southern California, as well as Kentucky online, www.filmlandspirits.com. Like, and follow us on uh, Instagram and Facebook at film and spirits. But um, another way that they can find and purchase our products online would be through the link that we've provided you guys as an affiliate partner, right? And uh, I would I would encourage folks to actually look for the link that I assume you're going to post online. You probably have more detail than me. Um, and and follow that over to our store um, as part of our partnership um, in providing that link to you guys as well, right? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, at birdies underscore bourbon on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, no, not YouTube. Uh, Twitter on Twitter. And uh, you'll be able to find the affiliate link. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely something we're trying out. So, uh, guys, thanks so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. And Cheers, brothers. Uh, until next time.